Perfect. Well, thanks, Lillian. And welcome, everyone, to OER Creator Spotlight, using game-based learning online, a cookbook of recipes. Thank you all for being here. Today, we are really excited to feature members of the Educational Game Group at the University of Ottawa, who came together to produce the OER using game-based learning online, a cookbook of recipes. The Educational Game Group, or the EGG, as I'm told it's called, is a community of practice dedicated to game-based learning at the University of Ottawa. Created in September 2019, it brings together a group of about 15 individuals that use game-based strategies in a wide range of teaching or training activities. It includes professors from different faculties and departments like arts, biology, law, medicine, support staff from various services like the Academic Writing Help Center or the library, and students from different disciplines, all who have the strong belief that games can transform higher education and that this revolution will be fostered by a collective approach. The EGG is a forum to share experiences, generate new ideas, and create interdisciplinary or cross-faculty collaborations. Using game-based learning online, a cookbook of recipes, is the egg's first collective work. The panelists features to, featured today hope that you will get a bit of inspiration out of it and you will realize that game-based learning offers valuable educational benefits. And finally, they hope that most of these recipes, they hope that you will see that most of these recipes do not need many ingredients or utensils. So with that, I am going to turn it over to our first panelist, Mish, to get us started. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Mish Boutet. I'm the Digital Literacy Librarian at the University of Ottawa. So um, the chapter I contributed to our work is on cooperative games. So cooperative games are games where two or more players coordinate their actions or choices to maximize their ability to play the game well. So um, cooperative games can be used to build different skills, whether it's communication, negotiation, uh, strategic decision making, resource optimization, even spatiotemporal awareness. Um, but cooperative games can also be um, engaging icebreakers. And uh, icebreakers might be particularly important in the online context where students may have fewer, less opportunities for, for interaction. So, so a well-placed cooperative game can go a long way. Um, I, I think that cooperative games are well suited to situations where group work is required. Um, my memory when I was a student is I was never actually taught how to do group work. We were thrown into groups, we had to do an assignment, and we got graded for it. Um, so, so a cooperative game doesn't necessarily replace good instruction on how to work as a group, but what it can do is it can provide an opportunity to let the group practice working together as a group with um, reduced consequence for failure before they do something that they have to get a final grade on. Um, through a cooperative game, personalities can emerge. You can see who takes leadership. You can see who's more contemplative, who's more impulsive, who buys into the cooperative experience, who checks out of the cooperative experience. And it maybe um, helps group members figure out ways how to interact with each other when they're doing something that's gonna be for marks. Um, if possible, it's always great for the, the instructor to be able to monitor people playing cooperative games to provide feedback on interactions, make sure things run smoothly. Uh, an example is I, I had my library colleagues play this Nintendo Switch game together called Snipper Clips. And in theory, this game is a cooperative game dream. It's colorful, cartoony, whimsical, family friendly, funny but it also requires an infuriating amount of precision. And a lot of the groups started becoming frustrated with each other, if not downright angry with each other. So, so it was good that I was there to kind of intervene and discuss um, <laughs> other approaches than, than, than just getting angry. Mm -hmm. Also, um, after you run a cooperative game, it's always helpful to debrief with groups and really help them attend to whatever skills the game was trying to draw out so that, that students would notice. Um, uh, games can't always stand on their own because sometimes students get wrapped up in, in the game elements without noticing, well, what's the learning application of this, this cooperative game? Um, a, a super challenge in, in the online context is making sure that players have access to, to whatever software or equipment or um, other components are required, which is why 
Um, my part ties in with a chapter from another one of my colleagues on, on escape rooms and escape games. So, so virtual escape rooms um, can be the, the great entry point here because virtual escape rooms can be done with, with just a browser, um, can be run entirely through a browser. So no consoles, no controllers, no other equipment is needed. And, and then conferencing software such as Teams or Zoom or Connect. Um, so, so remember with escape rooms, um, that especially with virtual escape rooms, the idea of a timer is optional. If, if you res remove the timer, that removes just one additional dimension of, of um, pressure that's maybe not needed in a situation where, where a group can meet online uh, separate from any other group and you don't have people waiting one after the other to play. Um, with escape rooms, just be careful if you're using the escape room as a way to teach content. Um, it's hard to learn content from the puzzles you're doing because you're so busy trying to solve the clues. What an escape room can be particularly effective for is a way to test people's application of things that they've already learned. Did they learn the sequence of the color spectrum? We'll make a puzzle about it. Did they learn how to search a database to find a particular article from a particular author? Put that as a puzzle to solve. And that can be a good way that escape rooms can, can be used. Um, so in the chapter in the book um, about escape rooms, there's instructions on how to use Google Forms to create escape rooms. There's, there's also instructions on how to use this tool called Breakout EDU to create escape rooms. So I really recommend that as a starting point to get up and running with that. That's my five minutes. Okay, I think I'm up next. Um, my name is Lynn Bowker, and I'm a professor at the School of Translation and Interpretation with a cross appointment to the School of Information Studies. So I kind of wear two different disciplinary hats, and I'm really uh, delighted to be part of this interdisciplinary educational games group. Uh, the first recipe that I contributed to the cookbook is probably one of the simplest types of games that you can incorporate into your online learning. And it's something called an Easter egg. And an Easter egg is essentially just a hidden object. And now that we've kind of made the conversion to uh, largely online learning, we have placed a lot more emphasis on our course site, whether it's through a learning management system like Brightspace or whether it's a website. Uh, one of the things that I like to do is sort of hide little surprises for the students to find uh, on the website because it really encourages them to engage with the content and explore all of the material that is up there on the site. So in my case, I teach translation. So uh, a sort of fun little hidden object might be uh, a link to a site with, you know, hilarious bad machine translations or, you know, uh, stories about things that have gone wrong when translation goes off the rails. And essentially, the Easter egg is, is kind of like you could think of it as a sort of harmless bait and switch. So you disguise this link to a funny site or to a cartoon as something that appears on the surface to be a serious link. So part of the course content and when the student clicks on that link thinking that they're going to you know another reading to do or another podcast that they have to listen to they end up in uh, on, on a site that is actually a, just a little bit of fun and it's a way of keeping them engaged motivating them to explore the site and um, you know i try always to relate it to the course material as well so it could be like a cartoon or you know a parody site something that's just dealing with the lighter side of whatever discipline that that you're teaching and yeah really it's just a way of getting them to engage with the website and you know just relieving a little bit of the potential tedium that could come with online learning when you're all by yourself at home just you know plowing through mounds and mounds of material 
One uh, little tip that I have though, is that anticipation is half the fun. So don't overdo it with the Easter eggs. I try to put usually just one per module. If there are too many, then it sort of takes away from the experience. And uh, you know, if there's just one, they really do have to hunt around a little bit to find it. So it makes them work, but it also rewards them with uh, just a little fun thing when they, when they do finally get there. So that's so easy to do. And it's so easy to make it relevant to your own discipline as well. The other recipe that I contributed is uh, something called a speed run. And a speed run is, uh, it originated also with video games. And the idea behind a speed run is that you try to complete a task in as short a time as possible. So the motivation is really on speed, uh, on, it's sometimes called a time attack, uh, where you're basically racing against the clock. And so the point of this, it kind of uh, hit on this idea when I was responsible for coordinating the co-op work placements for students in our translation program. And in my conversations with the employers who were, um, you know, kind of hiring our students on a work term, they were reporting back to me that the students were doing a good job in terms of the quality of the translations that they were doing. So that was great news. But on the flip side, they said the students were not great at meeting the deadlines or the quotas that, that are normally set for professional translators. So they were a little bit concerned that the students were too slow uh, although they were doing quality work, there's no point in handing in a quality translation after the deadline. So uh, I decided that I would try to work with the students to um, improve their speed. And so I designed a kind of speed training where for the first five or 10 minutes at the beginning of every course, uh, the students would get a paragraph to translate that they've never seen before. And the goal was not to turn in the most elegant translation possible, but rather to turn in a functional translation ahead of the deadline. And so we did that uh, just for the first five or 10 minutes of every course uh, over the semester. And I really did notice an improvement in the students, not only ability to turn in work, but in their confidence as well. One of the reasons that they were so slow before was that they were, double checking, triple checking everything in five different dictionaries. They didn't have the kind of confidence to rely on their instincts and the judgment to know when enough was enough. So it turned out to be, I think, a really um, useful exercise. And we made it fun by giving points to the first five people who uh, turned in their uh, translation the quickest and we kept track of those points on a leaderboard over the semester and then at the end of the semester we could sort of crown one speed champion. So again not something that requires a lot of, uh, of utensils or ingredients basically it was just uh, an exercise that is repeated uh, with a short deadline and you can keep track of it over the semester. Um, although I started with translation students, I've also uh, used it in some of my writing courses. Journalists are another good example of people that have to write quickly on deadlines. And I've also tried it with uh, library science students because uh, they also have to respond very quickly to patron requests at the reference desk, for example. Um, I think it's something that, you know, really could be adapted to a wide range of disciplines. It seems that no matter what our job is these days, we have to work on a tight deadline. So I think, you know, the concept is something that could be adapted to a wide range of, uh, of subject matters. So those were the two recipes that I contributed, and I'll pass the word on to, I think it's Thomas next. Yeah, you know, uh, I saw some question in the Q&R. Uh, I think some of the questions have been addressed by some of us. So please feel free to answer if you, if you think you, you have input to give or we will answer at the end uh, because some questions are very broad and might be better uh, at the end. Uh, so let's talk about interactive stories, uh, which are a great way to get students involved in a story and to play an active role uh, in a secure environment. Um, any kind of role, actually, especially the one that would be very dangerous or impossible to play in reality for students at this point of their career, of course. Um, so 
During the story, students are faced with choices and experience the consequences of these choices. For instance, during the last semester, our students went in pursuit of Japanese whaling ships in a, an environmental law class. They had to decide what to do when they finally cut, cut the Japanese whaling boats. So should they use lasers to blind the people on the Japanese boats or should they use harpoons? They might be able to save some whales, but there will be legal consequences to their actions and students will have to deal with them. In that case, an accusation of piracy under international law. So as you can see, like you can have different types of, um, of events you can, you can uh, include in your interactive story. And I would like now to, to tell you a bit more about how to create these interactive stories. So first of all, you don't need to be a senior screenwriter to come up with a good story. You can simply get inspiration and material from real cases. For my whale adventure, I was inspired by the activities of, uh, of the NGO Sea Shepherd. I could use events that actually occur. The laser and the harpoon are actual cases. It's not something I, I just invented. And I could use videos taken during encounters with Japanese whaling ships. So I just use like things that were actually real and available online. But of course, you can always add new branching options or you can even create a new world as far as it fits your learning objectives. You can, you can imagine a world in the future, uh, in the past, you can create an alternative past uh, uh, world. It's up to you and depending on what you want to teach. Um, another good advice is to propose several branching options to your students. It will help to build tensions and students will feel that they have control over the evolution of the story. It will eventually become the story. To be honest with you, it might be fake, of course, because some of the branching options might only be like an illusion, you know? You might, you might propose multiple branching to the students, but eventually it will lead them to a unique path, no matter what option they choose. But at least during the story, they feel they were in control. Something very important, do not create too many branching options. Uh, or the creation of your story will take you ages. I mean, you can create as many branching uh, options as you want, but if you want to go deep with these branching options, you will need to, it will be more work. And if the story is not played fully by your student, it might be a waste of time, but it's up to the resources you have, of course. You can use many tools to create your own interactive story. So first you can use PowerPoint. It's, it's not the most flexible option, but if it's a small story, it can be easily done. And yeah, it's, it's pretty easy. You just create link between your slides. And so it's, it's not that hard. And most of us use PowerPoint already. So it's not like extra cost to create the story with it. But you also might prefer to use tools that are dedicated to the creation of interactive stories. Um, because some of these tools will actually let you see the full map of the branching options. So it will help you to see the general structure of your story and eventually it will, it will be easier to make more complex stories with these um, tools. So you can use a platform like h5p.org and of course you can use a software online like Twine, which is the most powerful tool to create interactive stories, but also the one that requires more knowledge to be, to be used. If you want to use it like to its full potential, you will need to know a bit of coding, but you can create beautiful stories with a lot of visuals, sounds, effects, things like this. So it's really the best, but you, the learning curve is a bit uh, more difficult. However, to create the first prototype of your interactive story, you only need a pen and a piece of paper to draw your branching options. You can do this like even without a program, you just do your story on a, on a book and you, you leave the story in class or online if it's a synchronous class. You, you can just do it like by telling the story to your student, presenting the options, and you don't need to make it through a, a software. So now let's take your student for an adventure, their own adventure. And I will give the floor to the next one, which is, uh, who is Jackie, I think.
Hi, sorry, I was taking forever to activate my microphone. Okay, I'm just going to talk to you about crossword puzzles, but I'm going to begin by sharing my screen. Okay, uh, hopefully everybody can see this. I'm just going to use a very few slides to talk about using crossword puzzles. Uh, I've been using crossword puzzles in my courses for the past several years. I teach anatomy and physiology and students have a huge terminology that they have to, to learn uh, as they're going through these courses. And so um, I use crossword puzzles, especially in one of the AMP courses where they have to learn the names of all of the bones and the muscles, which are derived from Latin, are hard names to learn, um, and, and students struggle with learning the names, getting comfortable with the names, and being able to spell the names. Um, you might not think of crossword puzzles right away as being a type of educational game, but they do really meet many of the criteria. As a student is trying to complete a crossword puzzle, they have to read the clues and, and solve the clues in order to arrive at the answer that hopefully is the correct answer and will fit into the crossword puzzle. It does foster self-directed learning by doing because instead of having students just sitting there and trying to memorize the names of these bones and muscles, um, they're actually working with the clues, thinking about the course content, and then coming up with the names. Uh, if they're doing the crossword puzzles online, they're set up in such a way that they can keep trying until they answer correctly. Um, it helps with spelling, which uh, today's university st students are notoriously bad at. They cannot spell at all because they don't have to write nearly as much as we used to have two years ago when we were students. So it really forces them to slow down, think about the word, try to spell it correctly because it has to, of course, fit correctly into the right number of boxes. And of course, with a crossword puzzle, you have intersecting words. And so the letters have to be correct or you're going to muck up some of the other words. They can complete these crossword puzzles individually, or they can also get together as a small group and brainstorm uh, as they try to solve the clues um, and come up with the answers to the puzzles. So I use them in anatomy and physiology because it's almost like students have to learn a new language when they're taking these courses, but you could use it um, for various language courses because um, it will be helpful with, again, getting the students to be comfortable with those new words and learning how to spell those words. And there's all kinds of other disciplines as well where a new terminology or a bunch of names for different individuals need to be learned. For example, history as they're going through and learning about all sorts of different individuals or geography where they're having to learn the names of um, uh, different parts of the world, different cities, different provinces, countries, rivers, and so on. Uh, and so crossword puzzles could be used effectively there as well. So students have to recall the word as they read each clue. Of course, they'll do their puzzles open book, but I encourage them to try to think first before they just go and look it up. Uh, you can tailor those crossword puzzles when they're, you're making them up yourself to link directly to the course content that you're teaching them. And then, of course, the crossword puzzles as well uh, will help with spelling. So the software that I use is called Eclipse Crossword. Uh, the good news about Eclipse is it's freely available for download. Um, and it lets you, it, it's quite user friendly to use in order to generate your crossword puzzles. So this is what it looks like when you're in the software. You can see I'm working with, again with some of those words that if you look on the left hand side, you can see these are very different words from a student's everyday language. Uh, so I enter my words, I enter my clues. I usually put about 25 words per crossword puzzle. And once I've completed my list of words and clues, then it's up to the software. I just ask it to make the puzzle. Uh, you specify the dimensions of the puzzle. And if you have too many words or too many long words for the dimensions you set, then it'll have trouble making the puzzle. And then you just make your puzzle have a few more uh, boxes in it in each direction. And then eventually it will give you a nice puzzle. And you just go through it until you see a puzzle that has incorporated all of the words um, and that you like the look of the puzzle. And then you make it available to the student. So because I have huge classes of students, often between 
300 and 350 students in each class, then they do their crossword puzzles online because when they do them online, they're going to also get marked online. Uh, doing them online gives them the option to try again if they enter the wrong word. So what they're going to do is when they click on an empty box is to be presented with uh, the clue and then they type in the word and it always goes in in all caps so you don't need to worry about if something is capitalized or not capitalized. You can have spaces, you can have uh, hyphenated words. Uh, it, there really is a lot of flexibility and you can see that I've put some quite long words in this puzzle as well. So they go through it and then at the end they click check puzzle to see how they've done and it'll give them the option to go back and try to fix some of their errors as well because I really want this to be a learning experience for them. What you're seeing on the right hand side is the kind of paper puzzle that you can also generate with this software. So now you've got the empty grid at the top and then here's our clues for a cross and down and this is actually the crossword puzzle that is at the end of our recipe book. Um, uh, to uh, help readers practice what they learned from the uh, recipe book. So it's, it's a very nice software to use. I've been really pleased with it. I've even used it more recently during the times of COVID-19 to make very simple crossword puzzles for my grandkids and for my grandnieces and send it out to their parents who live in different parts of Ontario and Quebec so that they have, can have something that they can give their kids to do uh, as they're running out of ideas and the puzzles have been uh, really well received by the kids as well. So you can really do them at all different levels. So in a nutshell, while crossword puzzles have been around for ages, my students still like doing them. They will do them. They earn 0.75% of their final grade if they complete a crossword puzzle com completely correctly. Um, and I have a very, very high participation rate. Uh, the Eclipse software, it's free, it's easy to use. Um, uh, you can tailor your crossword puzzles to exactly what you want your students to be learning. Uh, I set mine up to be done for course credit, but you can also just put them into your course websites as supplementary learning um, uh, materials for your students as well. Uh, and hopefully they will help with the spelling because as I say, the spelling by our students is really, really atrocious. So that's the end of what I wanted to share with you guys today. Uh, and so I'm going to pass it over now to Alexandra and I will go back and mute myself. Thank you very much, Jackie. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Alex Lido. I'm a PhD candidate in law at the University of Ottawa, also part-time prof uh, at the same university. Before I hop in into pervasive games, I saw a question in the chat. I think it's from Andrea. Before I forget, I just want to try to give you a resource I heard about recently uh, about mental health and game-based learning. So the University of Ottawa um, Health Promotion Service is doing monthly escape games. And part of the puzzles included in those escape games touch on the question of mental health. So that's something you might want to look at, look at on, on their website. Um, that could be a, a useful resource for you. So uh, I, I'm going to talk about progressive games. So it might get a bit mysterious. Um, the first thing I want to do is spend a bit of time on uh, the definition of a pervasive game because it's kind, kind of a different category out there. So a pervasive per game is a scenario-based activity that is going to bridge the digital and the real world. Um, in the field of gaming, gaming, we would say that it's going to redefine the magic circle, the magic circle being the space where the real world doesn't apply, the rules of the real world, they don't apply anymore. A purposive game is also going to blur the line between fiction and reality, and it's going to create a scenario that can be played in a real world setting. So basically, the pervasiveness, um, what makes the pervasiveness of that type of activity is the fact that it's going to spread widely within clusters of people, but also within physical environment. A pervasive game is really going to blend in uh, within reality. But what is interesting is from the participant or the player perspective, it's going to create some kind of, um, of doubt. The participant won't know if it's really a game, if it's the reality or if it's a joke, and that's going to create to stimulate curiosity. 
everything can be a clue. Everything can be a lead. So you're going to want to investigate and search and find what, what this means in order um, so the scenario can move forward. So uh, perversive games are a big family. There are di uh, different forms of perversive games and it's very much an encompassing category. And what you can find within, within them are augmented reality games, live action role-playing games, scavenger hunts, alternate reality games. So there are all kinds of scenario-based activity that are going to uh, mix the digital and the real world. So why is it helpful from an educational perspective? Well, the first and main point is that uh, perversive games are going to give long-term per perspectives when it comes to teaching. Uh, it's gonna create uh, a scenario and this scenario will create links between classes, activities, topics or concepts. And that's, that's gonna take the activity not only from a, you know, a very punctual, like an hour or two hours, but you can have it um, you know, during all the semester. It's also interesting from an educational perspective because it's going to stimulate curiosity and interest. There is something I need to look for. Everything can virtually be a clue. So where is it? What could it be? And that kind of, of characteristic, they very much foster engagement and positive motivation from uh, students, participants. Perversive games are also uh, student-centered. Uh, students are the, the one that are going to start the game by finding the first clue and they foster autonomy as the students are the main investigators of the uh, perversive games. So a few tips that we can share for online teaching and using perversive games. So um, as Thomas said earlier, it's the same for perversive game. Scenario is the key. Don't need to be uh, a very good a script writer, but it's still challenging to create a scenario that can be realistic enough. You know, so you know it's a fiction, but you're not sure. You have to create the doubt. So that's that could be challenging, especially when you want to link it to your learning outcomes. Another tip is that although a pervasive game can be on the long term, maybe all along the semester, it doesn't have to be continuous. You can have an activity every two classes, every three classes. You don't have to get something every single class. Other type of activities can be included also in pervasive games. So whether it's uh, escape games, puzzles, uh, crossword puzzles, quizzes, so all kinds of different activities can be integrated within the story uh, depending on the learning outcomes you are aiming for. Communication between participants is going to be key uh, for the simple reason that pervasive game is going to use the collective intelligence of the classroom. So it's going to be important to put in place some kind of uh, stream of communication between the students and the participants. Um, that's, that's, that's going to sound a bit obvious, but you have to be ready. The reason uh, why is because most of the clues or the leads that you use for pervasive games can be very subtle. So if your students don't see the clue you have to be ready with another clue so this, the, the game can still either start or keep going. Um, and the last tip, and that's related maybe to one of the biggest challenge, challenges of progressive games is you need to prepare the participant or your student. They need to expect the unexpected. This is some kind of a different activity. So you need them to think about what could be a clue, what could be a lead, how they could work together. So that's um, a work, um, um, in progress throughout all the, the, the semester of the game. And finally, real quick, uh, how can it be implemented online? So, um, unfortunately, it's a lot of DIY. There, are not, there is not a, a, a very clear recipe on how to create a professive game online. But for instance, the first clue, uh, whether it's a riddle, a hyperlink, a picture, it can be embedded in an email, it can be um, hidden into your learning um, management system. It could be, he could be hidden in the course content. So the first clue can be virtually anywhere as long as your student have the reflex to look for it. As I said, stream of communications are very, very important, whether it's a forum on the LMS or maybe through Slack, Discord, that could be also a way
for your student to uh, interact, discuss, and move forward together in, in the process. And finally, um, using mainstream platforms can be a, a tool not only because it adds up to a realistic scenario, but because it's also very much accessible. So all the uh, Microsoft Office uh, softwares, all the uh, social networks also can be used to create fake profiles, et cetera. So all the main mainstream platform are very much, um, should be used at least uh, for progressive games. Um, so this is pretty much my time. So I'm gonna, I think next up is Ellen. Yeah. <clears throat> Merci, Alexandre. So, hi, I'm full disclosure. I'm not actually sitting in a, on a beach. I'm in my kitchen and my hungry teenagers have just woken up. So if you hear noise, that's what it is. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about trivia and other different like little games that you can design in order to engage students. And there's a lot of um, you know, questioning about how we're going to keep our students engaged, you know, throughout the semesters as they uh, go online to, uh, you know, engage with the content, engage with us, engage with each other. And our different ways that, you know, the small games, you know, that might not take as much time and be as involved might be able to perk up a little bit of that engagement. So um, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, hopefully with the right screen, share. So this is part of the interactive uh, cookbook version that uh, we designed and um, the trivia and quizzes kind of pages give you like a lot of resources of types of game that you can use and you can use them for different uh, uh, you know, purposes. So you can use them as icebreakers at the beginning of classes. You, you can use them to uh, develop communities of uh, practice so that students, well, especially I teach in biology in first year and uh, first year biology students, well, they come from everywhere, just like all our students do. And sometimes uh, the first year can be a bit rough if uh, you, you know, you have to make new friends and all of this, and they won't have this kind of community um, development that goes on as they actually assist and sit in our classes. So uh, some community building can be achieved through these games and you can encourage this. Um, so uh, you can um, not only, in, uh, you know, stimulate community building, but you can also use these little games uh, to teach content or to give assignments to students to so let's say trivia games where you actually build questions then it's a very good learning activity for students to actually build these questions so you can eventually build a question bank and give these as assignment to students and then students can revise questions that other students have made and then they can kind of build these uh, trivia or make these little quizzes with very, very simple and uh, free software that you can uh, direct them to. Um, so this can be a motivating kind of engaging activity to do with or between students. And obviously you can actually make these games uh, not only really engaging and, you know, community building, but also uh, to really apply uh, uh, knowledge that the students have in order to test themselves and test what they know, what they don't know. Uh, so there's a metacognitive kind of side of things as well to these games. So I'm just going to show you here like a few resources that you can use in order to design these games. So uh, most of these are free. Uh, so that either the students can use them or you can use them to develop some of the of the game. So Quizlet is well known in order to, uh, to use as a study tool. And um, Flippity is actually something I discovered recently. And it has multiple kind of a, like a scaffold in order for you to design very simple games like bingo games or uh, Jeopardy games or all sorts of games that are easily incorporated into like a 15 minute session of synchronous kind of online teaching or community building or um, you can even design them um, for 
you know, st uh, students to use uh, on their own. Uh, this here is the Geniali website that I've used in order to actually make this interactive uh, presentation, well, the, the cookbook that we've used to make the, the cookbook. This site here is a, a site that you can, it's like a PowerPoint presentation that's pre-made and you just slot in your questions and then you can play Jeopardy with your students and that's quite good. Charades is a type of game that, you know, you have this word and you can play uh, you can, you know, pe you, people, the person who's showing the word has to guess what the word is according to the clues that the participants are telling that person. Kahoot is also like a platform where you can design all sorts of games. But I think that to really use it effectively, you have to pay it. But I've never actually used it myself, but I've been told all sorts of good things from it. And this aha slides here can actually make build interactive slides and quiz uh, uh, at, within your presentation as well and all sorts of other things that you can do uh, in order to create something that's uh, more gamified and more interactive. So as icebreakers, I was going to just show you this. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to go around my screen here. This type of game that you can do as well for motivating your students to go around your syllabus, right? So that's always a good thing. So this is in French, but you get the gist. It says, do you know your class well? And then you have the different topic. It's like a trivia pursuit type of game where, you know, oh, well, I, uh, this is a question about the exams. And then they click on the actual little pie. And it says, when were your first partial exam going to be? And then the actual date is revealed, right? So you can build these games in order to just incite your students to <laughs> go around your syllabus. And, you know, just generally, it doesn't have to be about content. It can be about mental health. Where do you, you know, if you're in distress, where do you go? Uh, who can you call? And, you know, all these little um, things that we want our students to know, but it's not something that you would always tell in a class, but um, anyway. So there's all sorts of things that you can do with those games. And what I really like is that the uh, creativity that you have is in unlimited really. And uh, with very little time, in a, in a, like investment, you can have like a big impact. So that's what I like about it. And I'm gonna stop sharing this screen if I can. Stop share there. Wonderful. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for all of the great activities and ideas that you've shared. Um, I've seen a lot of engagement in the chat and in the note taking document with resources being shared back and forth. So there's been some great discussion here. Um, I think we have just a few minutes remaining and I've seen some questions come in and, and our panelists have done a great job answering the questions. Um, I would encourage attendees if you have any other questions, uh, to please feel free to drop them in the chat. And we can take the last few minutes here to just address some that are remaining. So Jackie, I see that there's a question for you about the crossword puzzles. There have been a few, but this question is, how do you mark your crossword puzzles? Uh, it's an excellent question. Uh, I tried to answer it, but I think I made an error, so it didn't show up when I answered it. So with my huge classes, uh, what's really good about the software is the software marks the puzzles. So students complete the puzzles. And then when they uh, uh, click on check puzzle, then a little box comes up either saying, congratulations, you got everything right, or it will say how many errors there are. Uh, so when I give the crossword puzzles as an assignment, uh, I use the assignment function of Brightspace, which is our learning management system. And then I ask them to just take a screenshot of that, that completed puzzle with the score box and to submit that. And then I still have to manually grade by looking at how many they got right to give them their score, but I don't have to go through and look at the puzzle at all and try to correct it. That's wonderful. Thank, thank you, Jackie. And I ha uh, there's a question here about the translation um, activities that were shared earlier on in this session. So the question here is, are students allowed to use machine translation when doing the fast translation task? What is the, what if the fastest one also makes the most errors? Yes, so it's not a perfect uh, system. Um, what I insist on is that the translation has to be complete. 
Um, but I'm not grading them on the quality of their translation. I'm really just trying to instill a, a kind of habit of working a little more quickly. So they're not graded. It's really a fun activity. They're not graded on the quality of their translation at all. Um, but the translation has to be complete. They can't submit just, you know, one sentence out of a five uh, sentence paragraph. Um, as for machine translation, no, not for this activity. Obviously, you cannot work faster than a machine translation system. So um, the idea here is to, again, like instill the habit in them of working quickly. Uh, I certainly do allow the use of machine translation in other types of activities and other um, parts of the course because, well, it's a, it's a great tool and why would you not teach students how to use it well, um, but not for the speed training per se. Thank you, Lynn. There's a question here for Alain. What was the software you were using for the pie chart that you showed? Geniality. So there's a part of it that is free or you can buy it um, like the pro version, but it's pretty reasonable for like for a whole year, it's like 50 US or something. That's great. Thanks for dropping that um, the name in the chat too. All right, and so I, I think we have time for two more questions and I think that these are questions more for the general uh, group. So anybody who has an answer, please feel free to chime in. Um, there's a question here from Rita about accessibility. Are many of these games that you've discussed today accessible? Well, <clears throat> um, regarding perversive games and uh, escape games as well, we, we've been using a lot of uh, videos. And so um, one aspect of making the videos accessible was to, uh, to integrate subtitles. So that's, that's manageable. It's time consuming, of, of course, but it's definitely manageable. And then depending on what uh, tools you're using, um, some of them are, um, you know, can be used to make accessible friendly documents. So if you just use Word documents to create, um, that, that works. I don't know for the other colleagues, for their activities, if, if it's, if it can be read for instance, by software. Uh, maybe Alex, because, uh, yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's uh, sorry for something else. Are there any other thoughts on that? Um, well, um, for escape rooms, if you run your escape room through a web browser, it would just be the, the accessibility of the individual web pages that, that, that you're creating for it. So um, you would look into the accessibility of whether Google Forms, Microsoft Forms, um, or putting videos that have closed captions, for example. So it can work for the escape rooms online. Yeah. For, for the captions, you can actually, I think you can use YouTube, you can add your own subtitles. I think that iMovie is limited, you cannot, you cannot use it, you cannot use subtitles, so you only need to pay and get like the Final Cut Pro uh, software, which is, it's not cheap, but you have some education prices. Um, but it's, it's, it's something you can do. It's more work, but it's, uh, it's worth it actually. Okay, thank you all for sharing your thoughts on that. Oh, is there somebody yeah. else? Just, just maybe because someone asked like, uh, if there is a free platform to create pervasive games, I don't think you will find a platform to create a pervasive games because as Alex mentioned, you need to, to gather a lot of resources and tools like uh, social media, emails, telephone numbers, uh, hyperlink. So I, I never seen a platform that make you able to, to create a game like this, but, um, but you could find advices. I think we, we gave some links to websites that help you to build a pervasive games, but it's one, it's one of the most open activity I would say. So it's very hard to give you a model uh, on how to create it. I, I feel each story, each pervasive game is a model. So yeah, it's, it's hard for this. You won't have a platform to, to create it like this from, from A to Z. 
Thanks, Thomas. And now one final question that um, has been asked and upvoted a lot, so we'll end on this. Um, Mish, I think you already had a good answer for this, so maybe we can talk about it now. Um, in thinking about large introductory asynchronous courses, what kinds of games are suited well to this kind of online learning? All right, I, and my answer might not be very satisfying because um, my answer is like, well, what do you want to do with your game? Um, a large introductory asynchronous class, do you want each individual person to play their own game? So if so, a single player web browser game, quick and easy, everybody can play that. Um, do you want to do something where people play in groups. And if you have a large class, that can be really hard to coordinate. So uh, another approach could be some sort of game where everybody's contribution contributes to a score. And so the entire class contributes to a score, whether by answering trivia questions or contributing ideas for how the class runs. And once they reach a certain threshold, then the class has won. And that's the end of the game. So those are a couple of my ideas, but I welcome my colleagues to throw in other ideas. So I wrote in the chat that all of them can be played asynchronously, but it just depends how, um, yeah, just like Mish said, do you want them to play as a group or not? And if you do want them to play as a group, even if you have lots of students, like we have 2000 students in biology, we can still organize group, that's easy. You put them in groups and then you tell them, you know, sort yourselves out where you're going to meet at some point and then you go through the scenario and then they can, um, so as they go through a scenario or they go through a game or a case study or whatever they do, you know you want them to do, then they can reflect on what they they went through as a group, uh, on how what they discovered as they went through the scenario, and this can be something that they submit uh, as an assignment. So it's all doable. We just need to be creative at this point. We we had a colleague that could not be here today, uh, Colin. Uh, the clicker case is doing it with large groups, I think, like uh, hundreds of students. Alex, maybe you can confirm. It's yeah, it's the first recipe in the cookbook, and and it's um, specifically was specifically designed for large groups. So that's something you might want to look at. But if I may add something very quickly uh, regarding pervasive games, and more specifically alternate reality games, uh, those are usually activities that bring together thousands of people on the internet on Twitter. Um, if you Google it, you'll see some examples. I'm thinking, so this is not educational, but I'm thinking of uh, Stranger Things for season three that uh, created an uh, alternate reality game. And also the Hello 2, the video game that back in the days did the I Love Bees alternate reality game. So those are made for very large amount like of people. So that's definitely manageable to create the conditions to have a pervasive or alternate reality game uh, in a big class. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing your thoughts on that on that question. I know it was one that a, a lot of our attendees had. And um, thank you again to all, all of our panelists from the University of Ottawa for sharing uh, these activities and resources and giving us some insight into the cookbook. This has been really great. And thank you all to our attendees as well. Um, for all the great discussion. I'm going to turn it over to Lillian to conclude. Thank you guys so much um, for being here. We do these every single month. I just have two quick plugs before uh, we sign off. First, um, I just want you all to know if you are excited about this kind of work and um, you wanna hear more about it or you wanna submit a presentation, um, our annual conference, the Technology and Education Seminar and Showcase, the call for proposals is open. The conference is October 20th to 21st, um, and the submission deadline is August 23rd, but reach out if that, um, if that, if, if you would like to know more about that. Um, so I would love to have more presentations about how we use games to, to humanize learning from this group or for anybody that's in attendance that was inspired uh, by this awesome presentation. Um, and again, we do these every single month on the second Tuesday of the month at noon. Um, and next month, I'm just going to tease our next month's webinar. Um, we'll be looking at the OER Lab in Ontario Tech, which is a great group of students uh, that are supporting um, the creation of open educational resources, much like this book. Um, I'm really, really looking forward to it. So uh, we hope that you'll join us in September on September 8th. 
to have a spotlight on Ontario Tech's OER lab. Um, thank you again, everybody at University of Ottawa at the Egg. Uh, we couldn't do these webinars. We couldn't do anything that we do if we didn't have educators that were so excited and enthusiastic about trying new things and also willing to share in the open. Um, and we're really, really grateful uh, to you. Uh, and um, have a wonderful rest of your hot August afternoon. <laughs> Thank you.